The people of the United States are preparing to inaugurate a new president. They travel to the nation's capital from the north, the south, east, and west to witness the quadrennial event. These people in Los Angeles on the west coast will cross a continent to reach Washington. In Chicago, in middle America, thousands more will speed eastward in special trains. And under the tropical sun of Florida lies Miami, whence every means of travel is used for the 1,200-mile journey northward. Similar scenes are being enacted all over the nation. Snow lies deep in New Hampshire in the Northeast. From this state, citizens leave their homes for the two-day motor trip to Washington. And at the Capitol, thousands pour into the city. Some arrive in costumes they will wear in the inaugural parade. These men bring a model of a pioneer coach. And here with his wife arrives Dwight D. Eisenhower, chosen by the people as their new president. Major John Eisenhower has come from the United Nations forces in Korea to see his father take office. Hotels are filled to overflowing, and railway cars serve as temporary abodes. On the morning of Inauguration Day, the President-elect and Mrs. Eisenhower attend religious services. Similar services for the new President are held throughout the country. As crowds form for the ceremonies, the president-elect and Mrs. Eisenhower, along with congressional leaders, arrive at the White House, the official home of the president. They are met by the retiring president and Mrs. Truman. Mr. Truman, who has served nearly eight years, and the man elected to succeed him, start for the Capitol, where the reins of office will change hands. Nearly a million persons are in the streets to acclaim them. the Capitol building where presidents have been sworn into office since 1801, some 150,000 persons gather. Focused on the waiting throng are newsreel and television cameras to carry the day's events to the world. The dignitaries file through the Capitol rotunda toward the portico where the transfer of the presidency will occur. Here are members of Congress. Behind them, members of the Supreme Court of the United States in judicial robes. With the heads of the military services is a former chief of staff, General George Marshall, now retired. Honored guests at the inauguration are members of the diplomatic corps. Also present is the cabinet of Mr. Truman, which is attending as its last official act, and former President Herbert Hoover. Last to enter the portico is Mr. Eisenhower, who will be the civilian leader of the United States for the next four years. And Mr. Truman joins in the applause that greets Mr. Eisenhower. First to take the oath of office is the Vice President, Richard Nixon and that I will well and faithfully execute the office upon which I am about to embark. So help me God. So help me God. Then Mr. Eisenhower is sworn in by the Chief Justice of the United States.
Dwight D. Eisenhower do solemnly swear. I, Dwight D. Eisenhower, do solemnly swear that you will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States, that I will faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States, and will, to the best of your ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. A hand clasp symbolizes the constitutional transfer of the presidency. The throng awaits the inaugural address. Following a custom established by George Washington, the first president, the new president outlines the principles that will guide his administration. My friends, uh, before I begin the expression of those thoughts that I deem appropriate uh, to this moment, would you permit me the privilege of uttering a little private prayer of my own? And I ask that you bow your heads. Almighty God, as we stand here at this moment, my associates in the, my future associates in the executive branch of government join me in beseeching that thou will make full and complete our dedication to the service of the people in this throng and their fellow citizens everywhere. Give us, we pray, the power to discern clearly right from wrong and allow all our words and actions to be governed thereby and by the laws of this land. Especially we pray that our concern shall be for all the people, regardless of station, race, or calling. May cooperation be permitted and be the mutual aim of those who, under the concepts of our Constitution, hold to differing political faiths, so that all may work for the good of our beloved country and thy glory. Amen. We are summoned by this honored and historic ceremony to witness more than the act of one citizen swearing his oath of service in the presence of his God. We are called as a people to give testimony in the sight of the world to our faith that the future shall belong to the free. At such a time in history, we who are free must proclaim anew our faith. This faith is the abiding creed of our fathers. It is our faith in the deathless dignity of man are governed by eternal moral and natural laws. This faith defines our full view of life. It establishes beyond debate those gifts of the Creator that are man's inalienable rights and that make all men equal in his sight. The enemies of this faith know no God but force, no devotion but its use. They tutor men in prison. They feed upon the hunger of others. Whatever defies them, they torture, especially the truth. Here, then, is joined no argument between slightly different philosophies. This conflict strikes directly at the faith of our fathers and at the lives of our sons. 